Were the people of the Bible real flesh and blood characters? Or the inventions of overheated imaginations? We explore the stories of Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, and Daniel, and the children of Israel. They begin their lives in Egypt and lead us to the coming of a mighty deliverer. Are these famous stories the truth, or are they fairy tales? If these stories are true, then life has purpose and meaning. Join us as we explore how the lives of ancient pharaohs and prophets continue to shape ours. This ancient book that many people believe is divinely inspired was born here in the land of Egypt. What can a person truly believe is at stake here? Our Western civilization is based on the Bible, but is the foundation rotten to the core? In other words, is the Bible telling us the truth or is it one big lie? I'm John Carter in Egypt. The Bible tells the story of mighty men who are followers of the true God. First, there was Abraham, loved and respected by the Jews, Arabs, and Christians. All three of these religions trace their ancestry back to Father Abraham, the friend of God. These religions tell us Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. From Isaac came the Jews, while Ishmael was the ancestor of the Arabs. Isaac had a son named Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons. One of these was Joseph. Joseph's brothers were jealous of him. The going price of a slave during this time was 20 pieces of silver. So they sold him to an Egyptian official called Potiphar. Then they told their father that Joseph was dead. Genesis 37, 28 says, So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Potiphar began to trust Joseph. It was common practice at that time that those in power would have their slaves work closely with them. Genesis 39 tells the story. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had, with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took note of him and she said to him, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he said, my master does not concern himself with anything in his house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? When she saw that he'd left his cloak in her hand, and that he'd run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. When his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, 
This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison. Now, there were two special prisoners sharing the jail with young Joseph. One night they had dreams, and Joseph volunteered to tell the baker and the cupbearer the meaning of their dreams. Pharaoh had a dream about seven skinny cows that ate up seven fat cows. No one knew what it meant. Then the cupbearer told the king about Joseph still languishing in prison. Joseph was called for and interpreted the dream of the seven skinny cows that ate up the seven fat cows. The seven fat cows represented seven years of great harvests. The seven skinny cows represented seven years of famine. The seven good years would be consumed by the seven bad years. As a reward, Joseph was made by the Pharaoh, the prime minister of Egypt. Suddenly, he found himself the most powerful man in the land of Egypt. The book of Genesis records the high honor bestowed on the Hebrew slave Joseph. Genesis chapter 41 says, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger, dressed him in robes of fine linen, and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And men shouted before him, Make way, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. The book of Genesis tells how Joseph's father, Jacob, his 11 brothers, and all the family members travel from Palestine down here to the land of Egypt, where they settled. Joseph, as the prime minister, sent Egyptian carts to bring them and all their possessions down here to the delta. When they reached the border between Palestine and Egypt, Joseph got into his chariot, got all his attendants around him with all their chariots, and they rode out to meet the old man and the family. Jacob had been told by the lying brothers that he had been killed by a wild animal. But now father and son warmly embraced. What a greeting, what a meeting. Pharaoh said to Jacob, I'm so glad you've come. The best of the land is yours. Settle wherever you want to settle. And they settled here in the Delta. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery to a man who unjustly put him into prison. In prison, he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams and was given his freedom. Joseph brought the brothers who had betrayed him to a new land. Foreigners like Joseph had now taken over the Egyptian government. They were called the Hyksos. They ruled in the Delta for 200 years. The book of Exodus says that after a time of peace and prosperity, trouble came to Joseph's descendants. The Bible says, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look. He said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. Exodus chapter one, six to 10. The Hyksos, hated as an occupying foreign power, were overthrown by a new dynasty of Egyptian kings. 
generations later, Pharaoh Tutmosis I had a plan to end the Israelites. He issued a decree that every Hebrew baby be murdered. But one very special baby escaped. The book of Exodus says that at this time of extreme peril, God raised up a deliverer. His name was Moses. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 5 says, Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the banks of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Moses may have been adopted by Hatshepsut, the most powerful woman in ancient Egypt and the daughter of Pharaoh Tutmosis I. Her father dies and she marries Tutmosis II. He too dies and leaves behind Tutmosis III, a legitimate heir from another woman. Hatshepsut has no male heir, but she has Moses. Hatshepsut took over the government and shoved Tutmosis aside. This made him real mad, especially if Hatshepsut, now the pharaoh, had plans for that Hebrew boy she'd found among the bulrushes, that boy whom she had named Moses. When Hatshepsut ascended the throne of the pharaohs, Moses declines to rule with her and he flees Egypt. Tutmosis III overthrows Hatshepsut and destroys her statues. The Egyptian economy boomed during his reign and he was very powerful. Moses hears of the death of Hatshepsut and he knows the protection she gave the Israelites was over. He returns to Egypt to face the Pharaoh Tutmosis III, who hates him. The book of Exodus describes the confrontation the Hebrew Moses had with the Egyptian Tutmos. Moses went to Pharaoh, locked him in the eye and said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, never, never, never. But after 10 devastating plagues, one which killed his son, Pharaoh had had enough. Go, he said, and take your people with you. Exodus 12. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt 
from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites, go. Worship the Lord your God as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said, and go. And uh, also bless me. Moses led the Israelites away, and they built the city of Ramesses in the Delta. But this was not their final destination. It's hard to believe that this place was the site of one of the greatest cities of the ancient world, the city of Ramses. It consisted of more than eight square miles of temples and palaces and other splendid buildings. Why is it so desolate today? After 1130 BC, the place was deserted and the stonework was cut off to build a new city to the, to the north, the city of Tanis. Anything that remained simply sank down into the mud of the delta. While there's nothing here today of significance, this place once saw a tremendous event, one of the greatest events in the history of the human race, the exodus of a whole nation and the birth of freedom. Moses told the Israelites they had to go or continue to be persecuted. They followed Moses, a brilliant military commander, toward the Sinai wilderness. Exodus chapter 14 says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people of Israel had fled, Pharaoh and his officers changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We've let the Israelites go and we've lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over them all. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Hari Roth, opposite Baal Zephron. The Israelites saw the Egyptians coming and said to Moses, it would have been better for us to have served the Egyptians than to die in the desert. But God told Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. Pharaoh's army, horses and chariots, followed them into the sea. The army became confused and the wheels of their chariots came off. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters will flow back over the Egyptians. The water covered the Egyptians and not one of them survived. The Israelites held camp at Mount Sinai where Moses received the Ten Commandments. One day, he went up to Mount Nebo in Jordan, looked out over all the land, and died. Moses was buried, and the Israelites made plans to enter the Promised Land. During this time, the Tel Armana letters were sent by the rulers in Palestine to Pharaoh Akhenaten, telling him that the Habaru were back and at war with them. 
But the pharaoh went on dreaming with the beautiful Nefertiti as his kingdom fell apart. The Israelites took the country by storm. While the events of those far off days are somewhat obscured by time, it is clear that the Bible story fits into Egypt's history like a hand in a glove. One could almost say opposition to the historicity of the Bible is ultimately frivolous and without foundation. The thing is clear. The Bible story fits into the times, culture, and history of the ancient Egyptians. Now, we're off to Israel because that is where the Hebrews who left Egypt ended up. Time. It takes only a minute to have eternal life. How can you get saved in a minute? It's simple. First, believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Second, accept His free gift of eternal life. And then, you're saved. It's not hard. It doesn't take any time. You can be saved in a minute right now. Pray with me. Lord God, I realize that I am a sinner. My sin has separated me from you. I accept that your Son, Jesus Christ, died for me. I ask Jesus into my heart. If you prayed this prayer, you are saved. The next thing to do is tell someone, fellowship with other followers of Jesus, get baptized, read your Bible and pray. Choices, we make them every day, all day. The most important choice you will make in your life is whether to choose eternal life or let it pass you by. If you'd like more information about your new life, call the number and visit our website. Welcome to Israel. After many years of warfare, the descendants of Jacob captured the city of Jerusalem. They built a great temple which became the soul of the nation. Joshua is engraved in our minds not just by the biblical story of the Battle of Jericho, but by those thousands of others who know the song written about Joshua and the walls that came a-tumbling down. So who was Joshua? Joshua was born a slave in Egypt. He was with Moses at the Exodus, and the tribes made Joshua Moses' successor. They were ready to end the Exodus and claim the land. From their camp in the desert, Joshua went into Canaan to spy to see if their army, made up of 12 tribes, could take over Canaan and invade Palestine. They recruited the help of a prostitute in town who would provide them with information if they protected her. Joshua planned the invasion and led his army into Palestine to overthrow the city of Jericho. Jericho was another powerful fortress city that stood as a mighty obstacle to the invading armies of Israel. While Hatzor was in the north, Jericho was in the heartland. Not much remains today, but the story that has come out of these ruins is significant. The book of Joshua describes how the Israelites captured and destroyed Jericho. Joshua chapter 6 says, When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, 
the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who'd spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house, bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver, gold, articles, bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. The only people saved were a prostitute and her family. It was necessary to capture and destroy a number of powerful fortresses. One of these strategic places was Hatsor. The Bible record says, at that time, Joshua turned back and captured Hatsor and put its king to the sword. Everyone in it they put to the sword and he burned up Hatsor itself. Joshua led the Israelites out of the desert and he split the conquered land among the 12 tribes of his army. He later died among his people. Hundreds of years after the Israelites conquered Jericho and Palestine, the nation of Israel decided it was time to get themselves a king. The first king was Saul, who was followed by one of the most colorful characters in the long history of the Bible. His name was David. David's life story reads like a modern thriller. He started his career as a shepherd boy who fought lions and bears. He soon distinguished himself by killing the giant Goliath with a sling. First Samuel chapter 17, 41 to 49 tells the story. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the name of the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into the, his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. David's courage impressed King Saul, and he took David into his inner circle. When the king was depressed, David played soothing music on his harp. But Saul 
jealous of David's military victories, focused on killing David instead of looking after Israel. So the Philistines returned to wage war. In battle, Saul fell on his sword and killed himself. David became king and continued the battle against Israel's armies and captured Jerusalem. It was a great victory, but he is also known for his lack of moral judgment. He sought God's forgiveness. He reigned for 40 years and died at age 70. Because of David's many positive and outstanding characteristics, he is called in the Bible, a man after God's own heart. No king in Israel's long history of kings made an impact like King David. We still read his psalms and sing his songs today. Yet, the minimalists, those earnest souls who doubt what they believe and uh, believe what they doubt, have long declared that David never existed. He was the product of someone's overworked imagination. How wrong they were. Not only has David's name been found in Egypt, it has been discovered here in the land of Israel. Bit by bit, the evidence for the reliability of the Bible is coming in. But the greatest evidence is still to come. It's about the prince, the people, and uh, the doomed temple. During the sixth century BC, the city of Jerusalem was overthrown by King Nebuchadnezzar. A group of prisoners were taken to Babylon and educated in their ways. One was a young man named Daniel. Just as Joseph became the Prime Minister of Egypt, Daniel became the Prime Minister of Babylon. He is remembered, however, not for his political activities, but for his prophecies. His most important prophecy was about the prince, the people, and uh, the doomed temple. Daniel chapter 9 says, No one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there'll be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. Jesus came and preached the good news of the kingdom for three and a half years until he was crucified by the Roman governor Pilate. Hundreds of years before this event, the prophet Daniel had written, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. His next prediction foresaw the ruin of the Jewish temple. The Jews rebelled against the Romans in 66 AD. Cestius Gallus, the Roman general, was dispatched to put down the rebellion, but in so doing, fulfilled another prophecy. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. Luke chapter 21. Jerusalem was initially surrounded by the Roman armies under Cestius Gallus in 66 AD. 
Inside the besieged city was a large number of Jewish Christians who were familiar with these prophetic words of Jesus. The surrounding armies were the predicted sign, but the sign itself posed a big problem. How could one flee when surrounded by the legions of Rome? But that is just what Jesus told them to do. Gallus retreated and the Jews took their opportunity to escape before his return. And although the soldiers were told not to destroy the temple, they lit it on fire. It was the people of the prince, not the prince himself, who destroyed the Jewish temple, exactly as the prophet Daniel had predicted. The prince, Titus, tried to save the temple, but one mightier than he had predicted its doom. The Roman soldiers did just what Daniel's prophecy had predicted. One can see today the results of the fiery catastrophe that destroyed the city. The awful power of the firestorm is evident. At the end of 70 AD, the Romans stormed the city of Jerusalem. Some tried to find refuge in the temple, but the Romans pursued them with a ferocious intensity. It was a stunning fulfillment of a Bible prophecy. The Messiah commenced his mission in 27 AD. He was cut off or murdered. The city of Jerusalem was temporarily surrounded in 66 AD. The Roman army withdrew long enough to let the Christians escape. And finally, the Jewish temple, now the doomed temple, was destroyed not by the Roman prince, but by the people. It is difficult to deny this evidence that shows that there is a God and that the Bible is true. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den by the king because he prayed to his God. God gave Daniel protection from the lion. The king knew Daniel was blessed and his prophecies served the king well. Although there is no record of Daniel's death, it is thought he died a normal death in old age. We've come a long way together, all the way from Egypt to Israel. We've looked at some of the evidence, actually only a tiny part of what is available. Everything we have examined points to the reliability of the Bible. I am absolutely convinced that the Bible is true, is reliable, and is the Word of God. I don't believe because of blind faith. I am forced to believe by the mountain of evidence. History tells me that those who choose to believe are benefited in every way. History also tells me that those nations that reject God and the Bible experience a great darkness. The stories of Abraham, Joseph, Jacob, David, and Daniel are not just fairy tales. The only way to really uncover the truth in the Bible is to first believe. Like the real people in these stories, we can experience God's grace when we fall. We can live a life of purpose and trust in God in all our circumstances. We can help future generations explore the truth and the wisdom found in the Bible. If the Bible is true, then life does have meaning. We are not destined to fall off the cliff. Life is good. There is a God who loves us. The future looks great.
Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. John Carter reports, We have seen God's power as the gospel of Christ has been proclaimed in Africa, India, Russia, Ukraine, Cuba, El Salvador, and many other places. We invite you to partner with us in proclaiming Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Right today to the Carter Report, P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. That's the Carter Report, P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. In Australia, write to the Carter Report, P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. That's the Carter Report, P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. Thank you for your generous support. We look forward to hearing from you soon. May God richly bless you.